I just want to start this video by noting a very simple fact. While Stephen Woodford's latest video is over 21 minutes long, when I accounted for the arguments already refuted, the new content only amounted to just 6 minutes 34 seconds. What's more is that said new content contains zero arguments. It's purely him dishonestly framing his opposition and the example he asks us to keep in mind as he opens his video. The only two arguments he makes in his video are the same bait and switch I dealt with in my original response and an attempt to justify this by shirking the burden of proof, something I dealt with in my response to Woodford's mistakes in many video. And this left me somewhat confused as to how I should proceed. But here I am, ready to storm another breach. I would like to add that I don't intend on playing the majority of Woodford's video. Why? Well for the most part it's one big red herring. From 6 minutes 34 seconds in, which is really the end of the new content, right up to 15 minutes 20 seconds in, all Woodford does is talk about the effects of puberty and compare cis men to cis women. The very same bait and switch I called out at 15 minutes 38 seconds in my original response. Though this time he spices things up a little by throwing in the odd fact about trans men, none of which offers anything to the conversation about trans women and their participation in athletics. Now I give you these timestamps in case you wish to pause my video, go watch that segment and maybe my original response before returning here to see if what I say is fair. But moving on, when discussing whether or not trans women on HRT retain some sort of advantage over cis women, it's not enough to point out any advantage they may have had prior HRT, nor is it enough to list traits that survive HRT and assert that these offer a net advantage. As I have explained repeatedly by this point, physical traits are not a linear or simply cumulative equation. It's not a case of plus 2 for height, plus 1 for bone density. Their relationship to one another is dynamic. By this I mean to note the fact that even if one retains their height and bone density after a loss of muscle mass, that can be a net disadvantage since less muscle is propelling more total body mass. Therefore to even begin suggesting that trans women have an advantage, which by the way is not the same as showing said advantage to be unfair, one would have to measure the effects of said traits as a collective. And this is a concept Woodford inadvertently stumbles upon in the example he used at the start of his video, that of Oscar Pistorius. In his recent video on transgender athletes, Noel Plum spoke at length about Oscar Pistorius, and I'm going to do the same. The reason being is that his case directly relates to transgender athletes, but does so without the political and emotional baggage. Pistorius is a South African double leg amputee who was once the centre of an international athletic debate. After dominating the Paralympics, he sought to compete at the Olympics, but his request was declined due to tests revealing, among other things, that his carbon fibre prosthetics used 25% less energy than runners with complete natural legs running at the same speed, and that they led to less vertical motion combined with 30% less mechanical work for lifting the body. The way that the IAAF put it was that double amputee sprinter Oscar Pistorius is ineligible to compete at the Beijing Olympics because his prosthetic racing legs give him a clear competitive advantage. Or in other words, the IAAF ruled that Pistorius' prosthetics disqualify him because they make him faster than what he would have been if he had not lost his legs. Now this reasoning is critical as it embodies both the principle of fair play and the principle of therapeutic use exceptions, otherwise known as TUEs. Stated simply, a TUE is an exception that allows an athlete to use, for therapeutic purposes only, an otherwise prohibited substance. But here's the crux, they're only granted provided there is no unfair advantage given to the athlete by taking the substance or using the method. What this means is that an athlete who suffers from a deficit, such as asthma, hypogonadism, or indeed limb loss, can take an otherwise strictly prohibited substance or technological aid to neutralise that deficit. If the TUE brings the athlete back up to 100%, that's fine, but if it pushes them further, say to 101%, that's most certainly not fine. Now this might seem pedantic to those not interested in athletics, but in the athletic world, 1% is absolutely massive. Just take for example the 2016 Olympics. The difference between first and second place in the men's 100m sprint was 0.8%. In the marathon, it was 0.5%, and in the long jump, it was 0.1%. And this is why TUEs are monitored with precision. Anyhow, back to Pistorius. 
Shortly after the IAAF rejected his request to compete at the Olympics, a collection of experts criticised the cited study for only testing Pistorius' biomechanics at full speed while running in a straight line, unlike a real 400m race, and for not accounting for the disadvantages that he suffers, such as having trouble leaving the starting block. And as a result, Pistorius' ineligible status was lifted. He was allowed to compete. Now, what's of particular interest here is that Pistorius' defence entirely accepted that his prosthetics give him some significant athletic advantages over able-bodied athletes, but they argued that they don't nearly make up for the many disadvantages that he has, and that therefore, as a net, he doesn't have an advantage. Now, I appreciate that this might seem off-base, but as we move on to the transgender athletic debate, please keep in mind the principle of fair play, the principle of TUEs, and Pistorius's case as a whole. So to be absolutely clear, Woodford's example for us to keep in mind is a case where a group of people argued for Pistorius's exclusion on the basis of a singular trait. This was then brought into question over the fact that it failed to account for the dynamic relationship between all relevant variables, and as a result that exclusion was found to be without merit, and therefore discriminatory, against Pistorius. Not because any further research showed him to be performing on par with athletes without prosthetics, but because, and I quote what Woodford himself showed on screen, quote, The CAS panel unanimously determined that Brueggemann tested Pistorius' biomechanics only at full speed when he was running in a straight line, unlike a real 400 meter race, that the report did not consider the disadvantages that Pistorius suffers at the start and acceleration phases of the race, and that overall there was no evidence that he had any net advantage over non-disabled athletes, end quote. Which is funny since said quote isn't from the CS reference Woodford uses. Rather, it's a quote from the section discussing said report on Pistorius' Wikipedia entry, added by user Nick Meekin in 2011. What's really odd is that said entry has been plagiarised in books published on Amazon, not to mention various articles, all of which I know Woodford didn't read. Now how do I know that? Well the quote Woodford showed on screen misses the doctor in front of Brueggemann's name, which, whilst present in the original wiki entry and the subsequent plagiarisms, is missing the current entry and subsequently his own. Truth is, he's a professor, a title his name is always prefaced with in the actual article reference. Another reason I know said quote doesn't come from there. Now, I'm all for using Wikipedia as a launching point, but you don't quote Wikipedia, you quote the sources it leads you to. Just ask yourself, why would someone quote Wikipedia over the source itself? I'll tell you why, they couldn't be fucked to read it. And whilst I'm glad to have done so from a professional perspective, it still pisses me off to see Woodford using tactics I saw of the London Dara movement. I caught them reading an author's entire publishing list, none of which even touched on the subject at hand, so they clearly hadn't read any of it. That's right. Woodford of Rationality Rules, references on a level akin to Dahl Apologists, like Hamza Sorsus. And just to note, I did check both of Woodford's IAAS sources on the matter, and neither of them contained the quote either. Which brings me to another problem with Woodford's referencing system. If you're going to number your references, then have said number appear on screen when you are using them. Failing to do so makes your work incredibly inaccessible. Numbered referencing should make things clearer and thus easier to verify. Yours doesn't. Now return to the quote itself, which, whilst a product of Wikipedia is still accurate, not that Woodford would know that, he does the exact same thing as the IAAF in his video. Only instead of focusing on a single advantage Pistorius may have had due to his prosthetics, Woodford focuses down on the possible advantages of the trans women through height and bone density. But when it comes to the burden of proof in reference to whether or not trans women who transitioned after male puberty have an unfair advantage, I think that it depends on the sport. The limited studies that we do have tell us very clearly that HRT reduces their red blood cell count and haemoglobin to within the range of 46XX women, that it dramatically increases their body fat, and that it significantly reduces their muscle mass. However, these same studies also tell us very clearly that HRT has no effect on their height, width or limb length, very limited to no effect on their heart and lung size, limited effect on their muscle fibre type, and that it actually increases their aerial bone mineral density. As for the other traits he asserts are present in the research he is referencing, that's just flat out false. 
The three studies he supplies at this point are interpreting laboratory results in transgender patients on hormone therapy, transsexuals and competitive sports, and preservation of volumetric bone density and geometry in trans women during cross-sex hormonal therapy, a prospective observational study. Now I read through every single one of these studies and not one of them even mentions heart or lungs, let alone compare sizes. And the same is true of muscle fibre type. So when Woodford states rather unambiguously that these same studies also tell us very clearly that is him actively lying to his audience. Said studies do not tell us any such thing and the pretense otherwise is inexcusable. Just to be clear in giving people who are new to this discussion full context, this was supposed to be Woodford's magnum opus. He took months to apparently research the subject and talk to professionals. Yet as the evidence provided clearly shows, he's not only flunked his reading, he's lied about it in other places. What's more is these four studies at the end, the three discussed and the Harper study, are the only ones with any real relevance to the subject. So he seems to have set out to create this massive reference list with little to no relevance. It seems he cares more about the appearance of being right than actually coming to an understanding of the subject. Moving on to bone mineral density, that appears to be a short term thing. Long term research of 142 trans women showed their BMD was similar to that of cis women. In fact, two out of the three sites measured in trans women fell below the BMD or cis women. Now, as always, further research is required to confirm said results. I'd just like to say thank you to Jenny from Twitter for bringing said study to my attention. But with all of that dealt with, now is the time to move on to Woodford's second argument, which is designed to uphold the irrelevancy of what he presented in relation to the differences between cis men and cis women. I speak of course about his claims relating to the burden of proof and where it sits. When it comes to trans women, however, the TUE situation is reversed. Rather than ensuring that their hormones, or TUE, does not put them above the 100% mark, we need to ensure that their TUE brings them down to or below the 100% mark. And until we can show this to be the case, we have not fulfilled our burden of proof. And yes, considering the many benefits of male puberty, the burden is on those who are asserting that HRT sufficiently mitigates said benefits. Right, well for those wanting to see my original response to this argument, please check out my response to Woodford's Mistakes in Many video. It's the very first argument I tackle, so there's no need to jump to any timestamp. Now, I will go back to reiterate said arguments using Woodford's own sources against him, but first I need to tackle a few things, starting with some moving goalposts. Namely what Woodford had pop up on screen just now, that stated quote, To be clear, by 100%, I mean what they would have been if they had not received male puberty. End quote. This contrasts a great deal to his previous standard, seen in the aforementioned Mistakes of Many video, which stated, quote, By sufficient, I mean within the typical range of non-trans female athletes, end quote. So why the change? Well, Woodford has to make said change since in response to Woodford's Mistakes of Many video, I noted that when it comes to height, trans female athletes fall within said range since that range would include cis female athletes such as Margot Diadek, a 2.18 meter basketball player. So for Woodford to continue to press height, he needed to change the rules he had laid down mid-game. No longer is existing within the range for cis women enough for Woodford. Now we have to somehow prove that HRT removes all effects of testosterone-induced puberty, even if said extant effects offer no net advantage. A demand which is frankly absurd. Thing is, this is not the only mistake Woodford makes whilst discussing the burden of proof, as shown later. And so, to put these findings into context, in long distance running, in which an abundance of slow twitch muscle fibres and haemoglobin are evidently paramount, it might well be the case to say that trans women don't have an advantage, as HRT reduces their haemoglobin to that of 46XX women, and 46XX women tend to have more slow twitch muscle fibres altogether. Add to this Joanna Harper study, in which she measured 8 trans women runners before and after HRT, and found their performance to be comparable in light of age grading, and I think there's a strong case to be made. However, in explosive events, such as weightlifting, combat sports, hammer throw and sprinting, I not only think that the burden has not been met, I think that the research that we have done has made it heavier than ever. Which is to say that the attributes granted from male puberty that play a vital role in explosive events, such as height, width, limb length and fast twitch muscle fibres, have not been shown to be sufficiently mitigated by HRT in trans women. Or to put this more bluntly, 
I think there's a good reason as to why we're seeing trans women who have experienced male puberty doing so well in weightlifting and other explosive events. Their TUE is, in the majority of cases, well above the 100% mark. So this powerlifter, Mary Gregory, put up a post on Instagram that she won nine out of nine events, meaning she got three white lights on all three lifts, setting a new master's world record squat, a open bench press world record, and a master's world deadlift record. And this was in the 100% raw powerlifting federation. So in contrast to the last story that we talked about, that was a long news. Well, for a start, most of the events you listed already account for height and bone density. As noted in my response to your Mistakes of Many video, I acknowledge the very simple facts that sports such as weightlifting and combat sports do account for this through their weight classes. The larger you are, the more you weigh, the higher up the classes you are. As for the case study you played at the end in which Mary Gregory took home three division records and a singular world record, this is not as uncommon as you suggest. In fact, just the other day, a cis woman named Amanda Lawrence, competing in a different division, took home three new world records, whilst one of her fellow competitors took home the last for bench press, completely resetting the world records for their weight class in said event. Now strangely, if Mary Gregory was competing with Amanda Lawrence in the division Amanda plays in, they'd both be in the same weight class in that division. Meaning that if Mary had set her division records there, Amanda would have taken all of Mary's division titles, whilst her fellow competitor, Daniela Mello, would have taken Mary's bench record, at least on a division level. Sadly, when it comes to world records, the dividing weight is 82.5 kg. Mary weighs a kg shorter that at 81.3 kg, whilst Amanda weighs just over a kg above that at 83.5 kg. Daniela weighed 83.55 kg, which is why when both of them pulled the same total weight, Amanda took the record. So I can't compare them directly on world record, but it does show how setting multiple records in a single event isn't unheard of. Now what really drives home the tragedy that Woodford has chosen to be a part of is the fact that even though Mary was stripped of all trophies and records after complaints were lodged against her, she still intends to take part in weightlifting via refereeing. Why? Well, because she loves the sport, and whether or not she is unfairly discriminated against, as she is being, she still wants to be part of said sport, showing that trans people just want to be included in what they love, and Mary isn't top of her weight class. Again, she only won a single open world record, though I find it strange that you go back to your anecdotes, even though in your Mistakes of Many video, you actively criticise me for responding to their anecdotes with more detail. So, for you to try and dump them on me, only to go back to using them, takes nerve. Yet, as I mentioned in that video, this is your availability bias. You focus on a couple of cases of trans women doing well out of the thousands of sporting competitions globally, and claim that this proves trans women are dominating the field. This is the same as a nervous flyer pointing to the few plane crashes that happen each year and claiming that flight is a dangerous form of travel. They're forgetting the vast amount of data and falling back on the one or two high profile cases that come to mind. Just like you. I mean, you were already scraping the bottom of the barrel pretty hard with your first video. Most of the cases you listed are not of world class athletes in their prime. You even drew on school level competition to try and bolster your case. So for someone who claims trans women to be doing so well, you don't seem to have the evidence to back that up. Then we have the ever-elusive, fast-twitch muscle fibres. I see studies comparing cis men to cis women on that basis, but absolutely nothing investigating the effects of HRT on said quality. It's become a bit of woo. Rather than throwing in the odd quantum vibration, you just keep bringing up fast-twitch muscle fibres, which sounds very technical, but you haven't demonstrated any relevance in that. So now that all the secondary points are closed off, it's time to deal with the burden of proof itself. You see, I believe the burden of proof is on Woodford, who believes trans women should be blocked from certain sports. And fact is, the IAAF would agree, if it were consistent. When it came to the Pistorius case study and the referenced article, they accepted full burden of proof. They had to show how prosthetics offered a net advantage. That was a standard they were subsequently found to have failed to live up to, 
and as a result, the Court of Arbitration for Sport ruled in Pastorius' favour. Now, just to be absolutely clear, this was not done because evidence was provided to show said prosthesis offered no net advantage over athletes without said prosthesis. In fact, the court itself noted that future evidence may support the claim that said prosthesis offers a net advantage, but until the IAAF can demonstrate said net advantage, they have no grounds to block participation. And this is something that was also noted in Sport and Transgender People, a systematic review of the literature relating to sport participation and competitive sport policies, which I quoted in my original video as stating, quote, There is no direct and consistent research to suggest that transgender female individuals and transgender male individuals have an athletic advantage in sport, and therefore, the majority of competitive sport policies are discriminatory against this population. End quote. So as we can see, the burden of proof rests squarely on Woodford who argues against trans participation in certain sports. That's something the CAS, the IAAF, and studies like these agree upon. So when you state the following, and my answer to the more controversial question, do trans women who have experienced male puberty have an unfair athletic advantage, is it depends on the sport. In some events, such as long-distance running, in which haemoglobin and slow-twitch muscle fibres are vital, I think there's a strong argument to say, no, they don't have an unfair advantage, as the primary attributes are sufficiently mitigated. But in most events, and especially those in which height, width, hip size, limb length, muscle mass and muscle fibre type are the primary attributes, such as weightlifting, sprinting, hammer throw, javelin, netball, boxing, karate, basketball, rugby, judo, rowing, hockey and many more, my answer is yes, most do have an unfair advantage. There are exceptions of course, just as there are exceptions to everything, but far more often than not, their TUE in such events does not bring them down to anywhere near the 100% mark. You do so without any and all basis. It's you who needs to supply evidence before you can even begin to argue that trans women have an advantage. But why is that the case? Well in my response to this argument in Woodford's Mistakes in Many video, I bring it back to a very important fact. We are discussing a person's human rights. Said rights include the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to sexual and reproductive health, the right to work and to the enjoyment of just and favourable conditions of work, the right to privacy, the right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and harmful practices, and full respect for the dignity, bodily integrity and bodily autonomy of the person. Now the rights listed don't come from any article discussing trans female athletes, but rather cis female athletes with some form of intersex status. And I use them as my opening point in my original response to discuss the ways in which blocking trans women or cis women from sports can violate numerous human rights, something which many of Woodford's supporters flat out refuse to acknowledge. Now how does the way cis intersex athletes are treated relate to trans athletes? Well for a start, both have atypical female bodies which many argue offers them unfair advantage over non-intersex cis women. And as a result, they both face the same sort of body policing and forced medicalization. Note, these are not people who have taken TUEs as Woodford presents. These are people being penalized for their innate biology. That's why the Casa Semenya case study and the intersex comparison in general is far closer to what happens to trans women. This is not a regulation for anything going into the bodies of trans or intersex women. It's holding their rights a ransom unless they medicalize themselves to align with Woodford's perverse idea of fairness, which in the case of gay and bisexual trans people, or trans people dating other non-medically transitioning trans people, borders on eugenics through coerced sterilization. And that may sound dramatic, but I'd like to remind you that in many countries, including 20 EU nations and Japan, part of the condition to be legally recognized as their gender is sterilization. So, rights at ransom is a familiar horror to the trans community. And do note that nowhere in the United Nations Human Rights Council report do they even discuss whether or not intersex people had an advantage or not, because it was irrelevant. As women, intersex cis women like Semenya have the right to play regardless of birth-based advantage, something that both Tracy Harris and Jen Peoples touched upon on the Godless Bitches show. But suddenly they are mm -hmm. so concerned about fairness to cisgender women in sports 
to the point where they have to attack other women. And it's like, okay, do not pit women against each other. Right. We do not appreciate that. Right. And, you know, I'm like, if they run better and they're women and this is a woman's sports, then what is the problem? Higher testosterone levels are only known to benefit certain sports. Yeah. And there are other sports that it's kind of unknown. So if a woman has a naturally higher than, than normal testosterone production, it probably doesn't help except if she's in some very specific sports. Um, but even if but, it does, it's like if, if you but, have higher but, testosterone, good for you. You're yeah, going to do better. Yeah, it's not like you're, you know, taking performance enhancing The whole drugs, thing is about but, how do we strip somebody from the right. identity woman. And this is a sentiment shared by others, such as Mr. Atheist. Hell, even TJ Kirk, as much as he is a dishonest bastard when it comes to talking about me, got the facts that if you see trans women as women, then you have no basis whatsoever to exclude them from women's sport. Now, some of you may ask me why I haven't taken said stance yet. Well, if we could go back to my very first video, I think it's time we had a conversation. Of course, this opens discussion about whether arguments to exclude trans women, HRT or not, from sports can ever be upheld. But in spite of my own thoughts on that and how they align with what the United Nations Human Rights Council had to say on cis women's rights, there's still a discussion to be had, if for nothing else, to clear up misconceptions. Misconceptions used to spin narratives such as these. And I'm convinced that unless quickly rectified, this will kill women's sport. I don't want to see the day when women's athletics is dominated by Y chromosomes, but without a change in policy, that is precisely what's going to happen. What I hope this segment highlights is that this was and has always been my stance during this entire thing. So the next question becomes, why haven't I made that clearer throughout my videos? Well, when I was writing my original script, I had to ask myself, how would people react to this if I, a trans person, was the one who forwarded said position first? As bad as things got at times, I have no doubt that playing down this position and only referencing it discreetly was the right thing to do at the time. Let's just consider what likely would have happened had I opened by stating that I believe trans women should be allowed to compete as women, no matter their medical status. Well, how would that have gone down? Woodford's fans likely would have focused on that one singular point and ignored the rest. More people would have simply cast me as another feels over facts SJW, effectively allowing Woodford to walk away without ever addressing his other errors. Therefore, I chose a different route. I needed to show Woodford's fans that I could beat him at his own game first, which I did to the degree that Woodford had to up and move the goalposts. At the time, I told myself that if I waited, perhaps a few cis people would push that boat out there in a more overt manner, at which point their position would undoubtedly appear more reasonable to cis people, allowing me to do the same. As for fairness in athletics as a concept, what Woodford is arguing for is not that. What he's arguing for is a death of sports. And I could spend time explaining that in detail, but a far more thought out creator who goes by the username Zevarus does a far better job than I ever could in his video titled Rationality Rules Still Doesn't Understand Sports. So I suggest watching that video to understand more about the very essence of sports and competition. And as that video notes, we can always revise our way of doing a sport if one person or a group of people ever comes to dominate, as has happened throughout sporting history. Now before I get on Woodford for the harm he has done, I'd just like to wrap up a few loose ends and offer a conclusion on the basis of his arguments in this video. Starting with the fact that in his desire to construct this far left versus far right narrative, Woodford actually lists Caitlyn Jenner as being part of the far left. This is a woman who acted as Donald Trump's unofficial trans ambassador, supporting his bid for president in 2016. And I really think that highlights more of Woodford's prejudices. The fact that he sees a trans woman standing up for trans rights and assumes that she must be far left. It just shows a lack of thorough research and thought. Speaking of which, it turns out that by professionals, Woodford is referring to his friend, Lizzie Lang. This is a woman I blocked soon after my original video was published for constant harassment and is hardly an unbiased source. 
What's more is she greenlit Woodford using a study that was quickly corrected by his publishers to such a degree that its conclusion completely changed from what Woodford had referenced, which again speaks to Woodford's lack of ability, something seen throughout his work. Me turning Woodford's sources against him once, as with the hemoglobin, was a mistake. Me doing it a second time with muscle mass was just downright funny. But me doing it a third time, as I did with the Court of Arbitration for Sport, is downright scary, especially considering his supporters' passive nature surrounding said failures. Again, this was supposed to be Woodford's great video, and the only thing it did great was fail. But it didn't have to. As noted throughout this video, I've already made most of my arguments. Woodford had knowledge of what I likely say, and yet in spite of having no basis for his views, he refuses to give up his position, which is why I am in no way sorry for what is about to take place. It's time to address Woodford's behaviour. No holding back. Some videos just need to be condemned. Woodford is attacking trans people's rights to exist, and to prove it I'll show 1 or 10,000 comments from people watching his video that fits my preconceived notions. I'm sick of essence of martyrdom. Oh my poor, sweet Galileo. Maybe you'd make yourself clearer if you pulled that hypocritical pity dick from your mouth. Nowhere have I stated you're a certain straw man, what I have noted is the fact that you've cultivated your audience, to a degree, as do all content creators. The sort of materials we put out, the way we handle accountability, and the way we interact directly with them plays an important role in the sort of audiences we create. So for example, when you like the tweet of someone who, in the very same thread, hurled racial abuse at my fiancé, that sends out a very clear message to your audience. This is a standard you have set. But Hinduism isn't a race, it's a religion. Yeah. And Adita is ex-Hindu atheist, so the only reason this person makes such a remark is because she's Indian. It's an attack aimed squarely at her ethnicity, not religion, which she lacks. Likewise, when you chum the waters with your alt-like panderings to Shapiro, Molyneux and Peterson, that draws in the alt-right who want your centrist pandering since it allows them to deflect criticisms of their fascist tendencies. The way you talk about them as being remarkable debaters who you just happen to disagree with on some points masks a great deal of the harm they cause and normalizes their bigotry as something benign. And you do yourself no favors on this account with your opening. The debate over trans women in sports and athletics, and specifically over whether they have an unfair advantage, has existed for quite some time. An early high-profile case was Richards in 1976, and it led to 25 out of 32 female competitors withdrawing from the US Open in protest. The debate was then, as it is now, incredibly divisive, and that's because it's driven by two completely polarised groups, who are, in my opinion, both wrong. On one side, somewhere on the right, let's say, people are acting as if trans people still have despite hormone therapy, pretty much all of the benefits that they receive from male puberty, and the more dogmatic among this group are straight up calling trans women men in dresses, while on the other side, somewhere on the left, let's say, people are acting as if trans women pretty much no longer have any of the benefits that they receive from male puberty, and the more dogmatic among this group are straight up insisting that sex itself is merely a social construct. The truth on the matter, however, is where it normally is between the two extremes. And within this video, I'm going to do my utmost best to show this to be the case. You're putting what you're calling the alt-left and white supremacists on the same moral plane. I'm not putting anybody on a moral plane. What I'm saying is this. You had a group on one side and you had a group on the other and they came at each other with clubs and it was vicious and it was horrible and it was a horrible thing to watch. But there is another side. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. You said there was hatred, there was violence on both sides. Are well, I do think there's blame, the yes. I think there's blame on both sides. So you look at you numbers. look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. And, only and, 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 and if you reported it accurately, you would say. The dishonest attempt to portray both sides of a debate as some dogmatic extreme, 
always benefits the most dogmatic party, since it reduces their opposition to their level. A fact which explains why people on the right, such as Donald Trump, and those who are starting to make a career from pandering to the right, such as Woodford, love the false equivalents. One would certainly expect someone with a literal game on fallacies, both formal and informal, to recognise and therefore not forward the informal fallacy of argument to moderation, also known as argument for middle ground. So, what you do here cannot be an accident. You are playing the centrist game on purpose, something which completely justifies my initial alt-light remark back in my original response. Also, when I said you had done a Carl Benjamin in my response to your Mistakes of Many video, due to not reading the figure annotation you showed on screen that refuted your very argument, I didn't mean for you to actually go full-blown centrist. Just to recap the many ways centrism fails, gay people are not somewhat mentally ill, slavery is not somewhat okay, and we shouldn't kill off half of all Jews. Fact is, there's also a large straw man at play here. Namely the fact that the only person you show even remotely suggesting that sex is socially constructed is Dr. Rachel McKinnon. Yet, as we're about to see, she's not saying that sexual traits are socially constructed, only how we group them. Well, it's not so simple, right? Like, sex is messy. Um, you've also, I understand, learned what intersex means, and there's sort of an open question here. So suppose that you have someone who looks and lives and has only ever known themselves to be a woman. Um, they have an F on their birth certificate, right? They were raised as women from birth and no one's ever suspected anything. But it turns out that they're XY chromosome and they have something called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So they're XY and their body's producing testosterone, but they have a condition where their body doesn't use any of it. So they develop with XY chromosomes into just a normal, although usually infertile woman. Are they female? I think most of us want to say yes. And what this shows us is that there is no clear set of criteria, just like with being a woman, to being female, and then this applies just as much to being male. So biology is not neat. It isn't uh, divided into what we call sexual dimorphism. There aren't only male and female in our species. There are intersex people, but there are also these borderline gray area cases where we want to call someone female even though they have attributes that we normally attribute to male. So because we have to socially make some decisions about which characteristics constitute being female and which ones constitute being male, recognizing that there's some gray area, we also now think that sex is socially constructed. So both gender and sex are socially constructed, it's just that they're made out of different stuff. So gender is socially constructed out of social stuff. Fashion, for example. Whereas sex is socially constructed out of physical stuff, bodies, biology, chromosomes, hormones, genitals, things like that. So the current thinking on the sex-gender relationship or sex-gender distinction is that it's not a clean distinction and that both are so socially constructed but in different ways. So in a lot of cases, when I want to talk about sex or gender, I use sex slash gender and just run them together because there is no clear division between them. So Woodford cuts out two clips and puts them together to make this. We also now think that sex is socially constructed. So in a lot of cases, when I want to talk about sex or gender, I use sex slash gender and just run them together because there is no clear division between them. The effect of which is it severely weakens McKinnon's position, making it much easier for his audience to discard it out of hand as simple SJW nonsense. When the truth is, McKinnon is offering a much more nuanced understanding of the subject of sex as an abstract than Woodford ever does, though I do disagree with her on some points, namely that whilst I consider gender expression to be socially constructed, I do not hold gender identity to be such. 
I view gender identity as an inherent part of the human mind, something the evidence corroborates. Now as a secular humanist, I consider the mind to be the product of the physical brain and therefore gender a biological attribute which I argue we should consider in relation to a sexual characteristic. But the fact is, McKinnon does not take the anti-biology stance Woodford potentially does in his video, and neither have I. Woodford has attempted to paint this topic as two polarised extremes with a group of enlightened centrists in the middle. That's even though I, Woodford's largest critic in all of this, don't fit in the box he attempts to put me in. So it's not just Rachel McKinnon he strawmanned, but myself. As for the debate being divisive, that's not the result of dogmatism on both sides as you dishonestly pretend. That's a result of the fact that one group, including yourself, is arguing for the removal of certain human rights for trans people. You don't get to exclude yourself from that by claiming the centre is your position. You may have moved on to view this as a case with only certain events, but you still have no basis for that whatsoever. You're still pushing for the withholding of trans women's rights in those sports, which is something we, members of the trans community, should not celebrate. You don't get to pick and choose which human rights you want to uphold and where. To be clear, you are not supportive of the trans community, you are certainly no trans ally. You are a transphobic hack. Something driven home with who you reference in your work. In his original video on trans athletes, Woodford used numerous clips of transphobic bigots actively misgendering and abusing trans people, whilst calling for the removal of key human and civil rights as listed earlier. And to push for all of this, Woodford made the following statements. And I'm convinced that unless quickly rectified, this will kill women's sport. I don't want to see the day when women's athletics is dominated by Y chromosomes, but without a change in policy, that is precisely what's going to happen. And yes, I will keep referencing said statements, since not only has Woodford failed to apologise for or even acknowledge what he stated there in any of his later videos, but he actually removed it at one point to make my immediate response to said statements seem disproportionate, because that's what a dishonest person Woodford is. He has to actively edit out what he originally said to provoke a response to make said response appear bad. And yet as bad as doing so in his original video was, in a move that is starting to become synonymous with his name, Woodford actually managed to make things worse in his updated videos. He went from quoting people hurling transphobic abuse, to referencing an organisation which has gone on record, grinning at the prospect of trans women dying slow and painful deaths as a result of cancer. Fair Play to Women, the organisation in question, sprung up in 2017 alongside groups like Wolf, Women's Place UK and we need to talk to spread misinformation about changes to the UK's Gender Recognition Act. Now, in my video, When a Feminist Isn't, Christian Astroturfing and the Trans Panic, I discuss these other three organisations and how they've been proven to be funded and supported by far-right Christian groups from America, such as the Heritage Foundation. Sadly, fair play to women sort of got forgotten amongst the entire thing, but at least now I have a reason to delve into the evidence surrounding their links to the far-right Christianity that I mentioned. Not that it particularly matters in the fact that they're still a transphobic hate group, and Woodford sourced them in his well-researched video, legitimising their organisation in the eyes of his audience, sending them traffic. But back to their relation to far-right Christian groups such as the Heritage Foundation. The evidence isn't as conclusive as with the other groups, though they do share many of the same traits. For example, for example, their crowdfunding campaigns receive a suspicious number of anonymous donations in the £500 to £1,000 range, sometimes seconds apart. What's more is who they decide to affiliate with, something which I need to look no further than the aforementioned tweet to show. Kaylee Triller, the woman who stated that she would no longer support organ donation if trans women could become pregnant, is the founder of Hands Across the Isle, a conservative organisation that seeks to use feminism appropriators and transphobic lesbians to divide and conquer the LGBT plus community. She was also a key speaker at the Heritage Foundation's Biology is Not Bigotry talk, which spewed endless myths about the harm caused by trans women in attempts to demonise them. But it's not just their relation to her that's rather telling. When I first saw this tweet, I didn't know who Slide All Man for Life was. Part of me assumed that they were the article's author, but their name was Suzanne Sederdin. Slidal Man for Life was a man by the name of Matthew Mason, and that's the point the For Life part of their Twitter handle 
clicked. And it turned out that yes, they were anti-reproductive health to the degree that they honestly believed Planned Parenthood was selling baby parts. They also spend their time targeting lesbian, gay and bisexual people and people of colour. So I found myself asking, why would fair play to women be cheering on far-right Christians with said views? Again, not definitive, but enough. Yet as already mentioned, whilst it is an extra kick in the teeth and I'm clearly all for that with Woodford by this point, it doesn't really matter in the bigger scope of things. Woodford still fell back on a transphobic hate group as a source of his information on trans subjects. And he did so after months of apparent research and repeated mistakes which should have, if nothing else, drilled some sense into him. Sadly, Woodford appears immune to reason. And that's ignoring Woodford's pretenses of being a trans ally. Fair Play to Women is a UK hate group that is one of the key groups targeting trans people in the media over the Gender Recognition Act reform these past few years. They're buying advertising space to the sum of tens of thousands of pounds in newspapers. It's not like they're some rarely heard or fringe group. Yet Woodford, the trans ally, used them as a source. Another thing that's been bothering me from the very start of this is the fact that as much as Woodford and others claim to give a damn about women's sports, they go after an invented problem rather than any real problem faced by said sports. Woodford has, as with everyone else out there, completely failed to show trans women are a problem in female sports. But what are problems are the differences in wages between male and female athletes, differences in sponsorship and coverage, lack of access in certain areas, and a general sense that whilst male sports are a serious matter, female sports are often seen as a joke by comparison. These are real problems faced by female athletes that Woodford could have tackled. And yet, in his very first video, supposedly in defense of said institution, Woodford bypasses all of that to go for a problem which hasn't been shown to exist anywhere outside of the typical tabloid paper. So being honest here, his actions seem more about hurting trans women than it does helping cis women. Just as with the bathroom debate whilst the right was stripping back reproductive health care. The last thing I'd like to do is touch upon his dog whistling. This was present in his original video in the way he kept referring to cis women as biologically female. And whilst he removed that, he's moved on now to using the term male puberty in its place. What this does is allow him to call trans women women to give the outwardly appearance that he accepts them. Meanwhile, it tells the transphobic elements of his audience, which are in the know, that actually, he doesn't really see trans women as real women that he's just been forced to say he does. But really, he's with them. It's a way to try and pander to both the people Woodford has wronged and those he has wronged them for. It's the same as what he's already been corrected on with biologically female, so it's just one more reason I genuinely believe Woodford is transphobic. Now the harm this entire thing has caused the trans community is immense. Many LGBT plus people report feeling insecure in spaces they once felt safe. Woodford's hostility towards trans rights has emboldened many bigots and even brought once great associations to their knees. So with both his active dishonesty and his transphobia laid bare before you, I ask this. How much damage does Woodford have to do to both trans people and the secular community before those who have been sitting on their hands claiming we just give him time, finally take a stand. So rather than me ending by asking you questions, I'd like to offer you a request. Start questioning the various content creators in the secular community as to why they still remain silent on the subject. Because the only way we're going to fix the secular community is if we actually start holding its members accountable. People have asked me to consider how my attempts to hold Woodford accountable looks to outsiders. Well, can you? How can we judge religious institutions for failing to tackle internal issues whilst we see a coordinated effort to police marginalized voices in the secular community? My actions are not what makes the secular community look bad. Rather the opposite. Holding people accountable could be what people see as valued in the secular community, but right now, they don't see that. And I think that fucking sucks. As always, please check out our other videos. You can also support Essence of Thought by Patreon, and in doing so, 
help us reach our goal of becoming ad free. We just like to say a big thank you to everyone who's already given to the channel, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Brad R, Mook Gay, Amit Dev Vojny, Muriel Zebenstrife, John Schoenrock, Daniel Martinez, Robert McCallan, Zan Braxton, Ian Heimber, Alexander Williams, Atlas Five, and Jennifer Hiller. And for myself and Adita, go fuck yourself Woodford, you transphobic hack.